and um, yeah, welcome everybody. Like, um, welcome to day four of uh, our workshop on the inverse problem. Really happy uh, to have you all here. And uh, the first session today will be started by Max Hansen, who many of you, uh, I believe, know, and um, he will be talking about the scattering amplitudes from spectral functions and and related ideas. Um, I expect to see hear a really Im impressive, interesting uh, presentation, given also the discussion session we had on on Tuesday. And I'm betting we will have some interesting stuff to discuss afterwards. So, Max, please go ahead. Sounds great. Okay, thanks, Anthony, for the very nice introduction. Uh, yeah. So the title I've chosen is "Scattering Amplitudes from Spectral Functions," and then I'm going to go into some more miscellaneous topics. Um, but I think to sort of take the broader perspective of this very nice workshop, um, what we've seen is that there are many different strategies and challenges for extracting spectral information. And there are also many interesting observables. And this talk is really going to be focused on the side of the observables. So I will comment a bit on the difficulty of the problem, but I really wanted to say once we've solved it, what all can we get out? Um, and now with the first click somehow, I wreaked havoc. <laughs> Sorry, Dropbox seems to think it's a good time to do something. One second. Okay, can you still see the screen normally? Perfect, yes. Great, so I'd like to uh, start with these sort of perspectives on Euclidean that we've by now seen from many others. So this is, I think, a, a well-established idea. Um, I think it's very nice to look to G minus two in the R ratio. And the idea that I basically want to flash is that the R ratio is this very complicated thing that has this rich peak structure of all the vector resonances that can be produced by the photon. But if we integrate this rich peak structure against a known kernel, then we can extract this single number which is the contribution of these hadronic states to the magnetic moment of the muon. And so it's collapsing all this very complicated information down to a single number. And of course, we know we can not exactly calculate the R ratio in a lattice calculation, but we can get the Laplace transform of that object. So here's the R ratio integrated with this Laplace kernel. And so everyone in the room, I think, knows that we can also directly calculate this number up here from the lattice calculation. But if we wanted to take a sort of naive perspective on that, we could say, all right, we want the R ratio integrated with this kernel, but what we instead have is the R ratio Laplace transformed. So we can try to form a new kernel function, which depends on Euclidean time, such that when this is convoluted with the Laplace kernel, it gets us our original K function up here. And if we can find such a K of tau, then we have a direct mapping from the Euclidean correlator to the hadronic contribution to G minus two. And so I think this goes back to the idea that we've emphasized a few times that smearing out the spectral information in a smart way can give us interesting physics while circumventing the inverse problem or making the inverse problem mild. And I'm really going to focus on these linear reconstruction methods here. We've seen these again and again, so I won't dwell on it other than to say, one wants to just play with the freedom to design a kernel that you sum with your Euclidean correlator. You can always represent your Euclidean correlator as some Laplace transform. And through this sort of straightforward series of steps, you end up with the smearing of that underlying spectral function. And I won't discuss these other methods here, but what I would like to stress is what I think Natsari already emphasized very nicely, that I think we should always think that we're targeting a smeared out spectral function in some context because the true spectral function is some complicated distribution, only with some sort of smearing can we even make mathematical sense of the object. And realistically, there's going to be some information loss in any numerical method anyway. And indeed, this also cycles back to the role of the finite volume, because we know in the finite volume system, the true spectral function is a forest of Dirac delta functions. And so if we could achieve a perfect reconstruction, we wouldn't want it anyway, because it doesn't give us the information we want. And smearing that with this resolution, in this case, the solid curve represents the infinite volume result, and the dash curve represents the result of smearing out this delta forest, we can say this gets us much closer to the physics we want than this forest of deltas. But this is perhaps slightly disingenuous because we know from the talks of this workshop that the problem is really that we have over smearing. So while any reconstructed spectral function must have some implicit smearing, 
the challenge is really to achieve this hierarchy of scales. We want the inverse box size to be much, much less than the smearing width, such that we cover many delta peaks, but we want that to be much, much less than the physical scales of the system. And I think it's really trying to achieve this window that is the challenge we face. And now I want to come back to, this is actually a slide that I already uh, showed in some form in Santa Fe two years ago when I first talked about these ideas with many of you. And I'd like to, to revisit this story. Uh, at this time, Hashimoto gave a very nice presentation about how one can access various quantities in unphysical kinematic regions without an inverse problem. So he was focusing on a different context, but I think the idea is the same, that in the subthreshold region where you cannot uh, create on-shell states, there you can get the spectral function just by integrating directly with a growing exponential. So here you have a region with no inverse problem. And we know that here, when you're really trying to replace the Laplace kernel with a narrow peaked function, you have a severe inverse problem. And anyone with experience in lattice calculations will have the intuition that producing this sort of sharp peak structure from the Euclidean correlator is very challenging. And one beautiful idea that goes back to Paggio, Quinn, and Weinberg is that in fact, a smearing kernel in this context can be understood as analytically continuing this object off of the branch cut. And so if you want, and, and here's sort of an illustration of that as you convolute your sharply peaked functions with this bright Wigner style smearing, it smooths out the peaks and it can be understood as taking you off into the complex plane. And so if you want, this blue region is no inverse problem. This red cut is the most severe inverse problem. But I think it's natural to ask, do we have this green region where we have an arbitrarily mild inverse problem? And surely it's intuitive. If here we have no issue, then as we step from the blue to the green region here, given that there's no major physical distinction up away from the cut, we don't expect things to break down entirely. So I think it's very nice to think in terms of this continuum of how severe it is to extract the information we want based on the smearing we're willing to accept. And with that in mind, I'd like to now turn to some of the various observables that we can try to dig out. And this is really my begin of the thinking about these things, which was back in 2017 with Harvey, who's here, and with Danny Robina. Uh, we basically started thinking about zero temperature contexts where the spectral function has some physical meaning. And one of the first things we thought of was the hadronic tensor. And so here you have an example where you have a pion, or if you want a nucleon state on each side, and you have two currents in the middle, which is not time ordered. So the key here is that you perform the Fourier transform without time ordering. And this exactly just creates a delta function for you. So there's a few ways to think of this object. It's just a time ordered four point function. But if you insert a complete set of states, what you see is you exactly get the sum over rates of the pi gamma to pi pi or to four pi or to kk bar really summed over all rates that can be created with the energy you're injecting. And so what this really is, is an inclusive hadronic rate. And the idea is that this is of course a spectral function. And so in this case, you can think of what's the sort of naive Euclidean analog of that, where you create a pion state here, you annihilate it here, and you separate these two currents as a function of Euclidean time. And the key point is that this Euclidean four point function is equal to the Laplace transform of exactly this hadronic tensor. And again, this ties nicely to what Shoji presented in his talk. But the idea is whether you're after the R ratio or whether you're after these kinds of hadronic rates, you can define a Euclidean correlator with a given tau coordinate such that the Laplace transform enters with this desired quantity. And then of course we face the task we're after. So given the importance that this is a distribution, given the importance of finite volume effects, and that this is an ill-posed problem, we now target a smeared out version of this, a so-called W hat. And we then attempt to extrapolate this order double limit, where of course the order is here. You first send the volume to infinity and then remove the smearing width. And so I think we've already talked about this in, in previous contexts. I think there are a lot of nice points to make here. Uh, for example, this idea that you have some freedom in which kinematic coordinates are sharp and which kinematic coordinates are fuzzy due to the inverse Laplace transform. But I actually now want to step away from this observable and go to scattering amplitudes or transition amplitudes rather than total rates. Um, and at the time of this work, I really somehow had the sense that these methods were well suited for rates, but not for amplitudes. And one of the naive concepts I had was, this is a manifestly 
real quantity, and this is a real relation here, so you're going to get out some real positive definite object. So it's somehow naturally a rate, whereas a scattering amplitude is complex valued and that complexity reflects constraints of unitarity on the theory. I couldn't see at the time how that would come out. And that segues into this more recent work with John Bulava, where with his guidance, we figured out how, how this could also work. And so the point I want to make here is that you can really get out essentially every observable you can think of, not only inclusive rates, but also exclusive amplitudes. So let me tell you how to do this in the context of pi pi elastic scattering. So this is just two pions in, two pions out. So the game is similar to what we've seen before. You cook up some Euclidean correlator that sort of naively resembles the scattering thing you're after. And so in this case, you create a pion with some definite momentum, you annihilate a pion with some definite momentum, and in the middle you have two pion fields. And the key message in this first line is, wow, these are single particle states on the ends, here you have some arbitrary choice of fields in the middle, and there's no one true pion field. So whatever exact quark fields you use, whether or not they're smeared, whether or not you pick a certain gamma structure, these just simply cannot be unique. But nonetheless, we push forward, and we say, this is related to some spectral function. And the coordinate here is really the energy of the third pion. So I'm thinking, okay, the incoming pion has its energy chosen, as does the outgoing. This pion will be fixed by the energy and momentum of the other three. And so it's really this one that is somehow special. And its energy is integrated over all values. So it's, it's clear here that this can't be a physical amplitude. But what's remarkable is that I can connect this spectral function to a smeared spectral function that gives me exactly the scattering amplitude. And so what have I done? Step one, define this row of E3. And step two, define a smeared out version of row, a row hat, which depends now on a smearing width. But in this case, rather than using something like a Gaussian or the real part of the bright Wigner, I use this full I epsilon pole. So I use a complex valued smearing function. And this already resolves the issue I hinted at. This is now a complex valued object and it has the hope to become a scattering amplitude. Here's an example of how this might be done in practice. You can break this into its real part, which is this smooth principal value piece, and its imaginary part, which is sharply peaked. The key message I should stress here is that we don't think of epsilon as infinitesimally small. We really allow epsilon to take on a range of values, in particular, the values that we can achieve with our reconstruction method. But if we can at least think about this in the formal context, what one can show is if you dig out this smeared spectral function, then you can go on shell by evaluating the energy here at the physical energy of the third pion. So just the square root P3 squared plus M squared. You have to amputate the external legs. And here, amputation takes a very funny form. It's just multiplying by this epsilon parameter squared, where we have one epsilon for each field sitting here. You remove some overlap factors. And when all is said and done, you have a smeared finite volume estimator of the complex valued two to two scattering amplitude. And then if you can take the famous order double limit, you can get out the physical amplitude, really the result that you can compare with other methods. So a few comments about this. Um, the derivation of this is really just based on the LSE reduction formula. So it holds whenever LSE holds, which means for any end to end transition, including those with an external current and including any energy regime that one can access. It's very challenging, but it's systematic. So it sort of pushes the challenge into the algorithmic side where it's saying, if you can give me good enough data and large enough volumes, I can get any amplitude I'm after. Although in practice, of course, it's going to be very difficult. And it has some features that we know are useful from other analysis contexts. So one thing I would like to stress here is because the operator choice is arbitrary, what this really means is that the estimator at some finite smearing in L will be different, but they must all coincide in the epsilon to zero limit at infinite L. And so you can imagine performing this extraction with many different choices of pion fields to get a better constraint on the amplitude. So it's somehow an advantage that there's an intermediate operator dependence that should go away in the end. And uh, I should also say, for those who are aware, there's a completely different system for getting scattering amplitudes on the lattice, where you use the finite volumes uh, as a tool and you really map finite volume energies into the scattering observable. So I want to stress that it's an alternative to this very powerful method, 
and probably these spectral function ideas will be most competitive where these methods break down. And that's at higher energies when you have many scattering channels to worry about. So just to speculate a little bit, I can imagine the biggest impact might be in low precision long distance effects. For example, QED corrections where you don't need such high precision and where in the heavy flavor sector, there's just no other method for doing this. Maybe similarly for um, meson, anti-meson mixing in the heavy sector. And it's good to have in mind, is this really different than the other methods? The answer is certainly yes. And one quick way to see why it's different is that these methods only use energies, whereas spectral methods use both matrix elements and energies. And I wanna show here a little perturbative study where we um, just calculated this object in perturbation theory. So this is the finite volume Euclidean correlator that we're using for pi pi scattering. You can convert it to this estimator again in perturbation theory. And then you can play with the required order, order double limit. And so in this perturbative study, you can vary the box size and for a given box, send epsilon to zero. And sure enough, for any given box size, if I follow, say, this brown curve, as epsilon gets too small at this fixed L, I lose control and I shoot up in a regime where I'm drowning in volume effects. But as the volume gets larger, I can take epsilon farther on my way to the true result, which here is normalized to one. And so in this work, we kind of explored you know, some extrapolation strategies. This is an ongoing question, how to best attack this, but you can see in principle what one would do get a series of volumes, identify a range of exceptional, uh, acceptable epsilon, and try to map out the scattering observable. Okay, very good. So I think at this stage, I'm a little low on time, so I won't give the full story of my Ani test. I just want to briefly mention this connection, and then I want to turn to a bit more discussion of volume effects, which I find very interesting. So one question that came up when I presented this work at, at various meetings was, isn't this invalidated by Miami Testa? There's a result of these authors that famously shows we can't get scattering information from Euclidean correlators. And um, one should be, of course, a little more precise about what was actually shown. So Miami and Testa considered correlators of this form, where you have some current creating a two pion state. And very similar to us, they say, okay, allow a pion on one side, and keep the other pi on as a field. And they actually show two very important points. The first is if you set the momenta of this pi ons to zero, so if here you inject zero momentum, then you're going to end up with threshold observables, in particular, the time-like form factor at threshold and the pi pi scattering length, which is just the threshold scattering amplitude. But they also showed that if you take momentum away from zero, then you're plagued by unphysical operator dependent contributions. So then these operator contributions really kill you and you can't get the physics you want. And in this recent work with Mattia Bruno, we basically argue that this observation is completely consistent with what I've just told you about getting scattering from the inverse problem. And the key message already is that Mayani and Testa consider asymptotically large tau. And so it's true that if you take tau asymptotically large, then either you have to accept the threshold information or be plagued by some unphysical operator dependence. But we are not taking tau asymptotically large in this approach. Instead, we're using tau as the coordinate for the inverse problem, which means we're really relying on small and intermediate values as well. And another way to think of this is you can really think of the Miami testa correlator also as some spectral function with the Laplace transform. I mean, indeed, every correlator is some Laplace transform. And in the case of Mayani testa, you can think of a resolution function as just the decaying exponential together with the fact that it starts at threshold. So if you want, you can think of the resolution function that the lattice calculation hands you as a theta function that turns on at 2m pi and then decays away. And so you see, really, Mayani and testa are accessing this spectral function here. And as tau becomes larger and larger, you're forming a peak that's forcing the energy to be 2m pi. And so if your spatial momentum is set to zero, that's great news. Then you're saying, I'm actually using tau to project down into the spectral function in the low energy regime. Whereas if you set the spatial momentum to some other value, then you see there's a mismatch between your momentum and the energy, which is still projected at threshold. And that's why you're dominated by unphysical information. 
So let me leave this. Uh, we played with ways of extending this idea in the work with Mattia, but I think I would like to jump now to a little discussion of volume effects. So volume effects have come up in a couple contexts in, in this workshop, and I want to show some ideas that we've had on them connected to what John presented yesterday. So let's return now. This is really a bit of a break. So let's set aside this discussion of observables and let's return to two point functions in this one plus one dimensional O3 model. So if I can remind you what John discussed yesterday, he focused just on a two point function in a finite volume. You can define this as a function of time and the goal of the work that John summarized was to study the inverse of this Laplace transform to get out this spectral function. And the key messages that I want to give is, first of all, we know that this function of time has only exponentially suppressed volume effects. This is where we really understand things the best. Second is because we have analytic knowledge of this, we can play with the volume effects in this O3 model to build intuition. And third is an instructive cancellation of volume effects in both the Euclidean correlator and the smeared spectral function. So first, let's, let's really talk about what we know best, the correlator itself. So I think it, it's intuitive to anyone who has experience with finite size effects that if I just take a two-point function at a given time slice, the volume effects will scale as decaying exponentials with the box size. There are many ways of seeing this, and, and I worked on something in this context together with Agostino Botella, and we showed a, a diagrammatic approach that draws heavily from seminal work by Martin Lucian. So essentially, you can represent the two-point function as an infinite sum of diagrams with all the low energy degrees of freedom, so really the, the mass in the one plus one model. You can then show that each diagram can be represented as a sum over all of its loop momenta, and that the Poisson summation formula lets you rewrite this as integrals together with sums over the Poisson sum. And finally, you can show through an analytic continuation that each diagram has exponentially suppressed volume effects. The decay is e to the minus l times some characteristic scale in the system, which is typically the particle mass. So this is the sort of starting point, that the correlator has exponentially suppressed volume effects. Now to understand the Spectral function is of course much more difficult. And one thing that's very nice is the integrable model of the one plus one O three is known exactly. And we can use this to actually predict the two particle part at least of the smeared out spectral function. And this already returns to this concept I mentioned of a whole different industry of using finite volume effects as a tool to predict scattering. So in this case, we know that the two particle finite volume matrix elements are related to the infinite volume spectral function together with a conversion factor. So this is called the lelouch lucher formalism. And it tells you, if you know the infinite volume matrix elements, I can tell you the finite volume matrix elements, provided you know also the two particle scattering phase. But in the integrable model, all of this is known. So we can take this as given. And similarly, the two particle energies are known. So we can plug everything in here and build the smearing function for a given smearing kernel. I'll use a Gaussian here. For a given epsilon, I'll try some different values and for a different box size. And so here's an example of this. I set the resolution to some small value. So here, epsilon in units of the box length is 0 0.1. So they're really narrow Gaussians. Indeed, here you can see the Gaussians. And this is really the solution in the two particle sector, taking the known scattering phase shift, taking the known infinite volume spectral function, and reconstructing this finite volume information. So you see that the blue curve is the finite volume smeared result. And because my box is just too small, so each of my peaks is really only covering one finite volume state, so I'm completely dominated by volume effects as expected. This orange curve is the infinite volume smeared out function, and this dash curve where the difference is quite hard to see is the unsmeared version. And so you can see here the problem is completely volume effects. And if I now run this little movie, we see that as we ramp up the box size, these peaks come together. But in this case, the under smearing is really severe. So one has to drive into a very large volume regime to start to approach the results. And so we really see this oscillatory behavior. And yes, Alex, Alex could I ask, uh, if you were to zoom out of this, of this uh, figure in the, uh, in the case where you're completely dominated by the volume effects, 
mm. would one still be able to see somehow an effective envelope of these peaks uh, that might, so the, the area, I guess, is still normalized to the same area under the curve. Um, and I was wondering, would you still see some functional dependence arising or is it completely uh, uh, invisible what's actually going on? So I think in the one dimensional case, you may have some hope, but in the three dimensional case, the height of the peak, when you're only isolating one peak, the height is dominated by some very geometric volume information, uh, including sort of the multiplicity of vector rotations. So yeah, at least in the three dimensional world, it will have very it little to do with okay. that. Thanks. You really need them to overlap, I think, to have a hope. Okay. And so this is the regime that we would rather be in. So now I'm smearing a bit more, epsilon is equal to one. Um, Actually, I'm realizing now here, epsilon should be in units of M. So it's actually epsilon over M equals one. So it's really a fixed epsilon in units of the mass. Here you can see the dashed gray curve does differ a bit from the orange curve. So in the infinite volume, the orange curve smearing is having some effect, although that effect becomes negligible in the larger energy regime. And now the blue curve represents the volume effects. And so in this case, you can already see as you dial the slider between ML of four and ML of eight, you already go from the regime of oscillatory to suppressed volume effects. And finally, I wanted to show this instructive cancellation, but I actually think it's a bit too technical given the short time constraint. So I think I would rather um, leave this for now and, and just summarize the conclusions. So in this little sub vignette about finite volume effects, what we know with certainty is that the underlying correlator has exponentially suppressed volume effects. When we play with this, we see what is very in intuitive, which is that we have a small volume region where the effects are completely oscillatory. And then as you drive up the volume at fixed smearing, you get into a region where you transition from oscillatory to decay. And this is the region that one has to be in to, to make use of these calculations. What I didn't discuss is that one can actually show explicitly how leading volume effects cancel. And it, in fact, due to the relation between energies and matrix elements, due to the lelouch lucia formalism that this cancellation works. So I found this instructive. Um, and finally, there's work that I didn't want to show yet, but we do have some evidence that indeed you actually have true exponential suppression of the volume effects, at least for certain choices of this smearing function. But I won't go into that detail. So let me close that there and take one step back to the broader conclusion. Uh, I think the key message is we know we cannot solve the inverse problem. So we only can get, and we should only attempt to get a smeared out version of the spectral function. Indeed, in many cases, the smearing is actually physically useful or even physically required, for example, to get the scattering amplitude. And I like to emphasize what Natario nicely summarized, that really thinking of the smearing as a target that we can choose the function we're after is I think a very useful perspective in this game. And in the broader context of this workshop, I think we've just sort of unlocked a playground of the calculations that we're beginning to explore. So I hope there's lots still to come and uh, I look forward to continued instances of these meetings. Thanks. Thank you, Max. That was uh... Great, really great. Um, is there any questions immediately? We do have time, so don't be shy. So far, I'm only seeing clapping. Hmm. So. But if we have time, you can uh, uh, give the details of the cancellation of the final volume effect. I think, yeah, if you, could, if, you, if you use like just five minutes or five more minutes more, I think that should be completely, completely yeah. okay. Okay, very good. I will, I'll try to keep it short. So, so to give a little bit of background, I got very confused at some stage about the nature of the volume effects. And so I actually went back to the basics and, and that's really what this represents. So this is now going back to the correlator itself where we know that the volume effects should be exponentially suppressed. And so what you see here is the finite volume representation, a sum over states, and here the infinite volume version where you have the spectral function. And I should stress that really these equations only hold for two particle states and matrix elements. So this is a, an issue that needs to be looked at more. But for example, this relation here really is only in the two particle regime. But what I'm saying here is we don't exactly need to know this physical information to already learn something. So let's say, okay, we have the Euclidean correlator, 
it has these overlaps and these energies. First of all, how do I take the infinite volume limit of this thing? Well, even this isn't quite as trivial as one might think. In the infinite volume limit, you know you need to get this result over here. And a couple of things have to work out. First, you need to show that your energies are dominated by the non-interacting energy, which is just two particles back to back with some fixed momentum. So that's what gets substituted in there. And second, you have to prove that this lelouch lucia conversion factor for large volume, this bit that depends on the scattering becomes irrelevant and you're dominated by only this geometric bit. That turns out to be the square root of the energy, et cetera. And what you can show is you exactly end up with a sum with this prefactor, which then turns into the Jacobian that takes you from a integral over K to an integral over E. So you can basically see that this lelouch lucia factor is exactly working out to give you the integral DE that defines the infinite volume result. So that's step one, the infinite volume limit makes sense. Step two is what about the one over L effects? In this case, in the one plus one dimensional theory, the matrix element has one over L volume effects and also the energy has one over L volume effects. And so it's a fun question to say, how exactly do these one over L effects not appear in this quantity, which we know has exponentially suppressed volume effects? And the short answer is that they cancel, but it's actually a bit instructive to see it. So that's what this represents is I'm really trying to pick off the one over L effects by saying, give me the finite volume object minus its infinite volume counterpart and really project out the coefficient that's multiplying L. So if you form this combination, you see many different terms contribute. So you get something coming from the matrix element. So that's what this factor is here. This derivative of the phase shift is exactly the same one up here. So this kind of funny thing that's inside the finite volume lelouch lucia factor, you see it appearing at this leading order. But you get a second contribution, which is from the energy shift itself. So you see here you have a shift and this drops down. And so you have a derivative here. Here you just have delta itself together with a derivative coming from Taylor expanding the function. And what you can show is that as long as you can integrate by parts, you can represent this as an integral of a total derivative. And so this vanishes provided you have certain smoothness criteria on this thing and then it vanishes in the borders. And so this is what's required. So to get the leading volume correction to vanish, you need the lelouch lucia formula. This could almost be seen as an alternative derivation and you need this integral to vanish. And the same holds if I replace this with any smearing function, as long as these properties go through. So this was the starting point. And I think um, one can extend this to really prove exponentially suppressed volume effects. I was actually going to present something there, but decided it wasn't confident enough. So I'll leave it at this. So our next talk is by, um, by Harvey Meyer um, on, uh, I believe the, on a finite temperature aspects of spectral reconstructions. And um, this is a very long ongoing work and very interesting work. Um, also excited to hear what's been going on here. And thank you, Harvey, for agreeing to talk. And um, it's, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, can you see this uh, well enough? I mean, is it full screen for you? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I can see and I can also see, see your cursor. Okay. Uh, so indeed, um, my talk will be about uh, spectral functions in the context of finite temperature field theory um, in contrast to what Max just discussed, which is uh, the role of spectral functions uh, in, in, in vacuum correlators uh, and the interesting physics one can pull out of that. Um, so let me start immediately with uh, the, the definition of a thermal spectral function. Um, so I've written one here for uh, two uh, vector currents that uh, are an important example since uh, they couple to the photon. And so to um, understand the interaction of a medium with uh, external photons, one has to understand these uh, spectral functions. And so they are defined here um, by a commutator of uh, uh, current operators 
uh, on the thermal states. So uh, the, the, the energy eigenstates of the theory are these uh, states labeled by N and then in the canonical uh, um, uh, ensemble, they are weighted by this Boltzmann factor, as you know. Um, so the, the, the structure of this object is very similar to, to the one at zero temperature. The only real difference is uh, the, the role of the external state instead of having one definite, um, one single definite state um, contributing here which would be either the vacuum or one particle state. Those are the cases uh, normally considered at zero temperature here you're averaging over all states just weighted by their uh, energy and this uh, Boltzmann factor. Um, so all the aspects of, um, of uh, the inverse problem um, are almost identical from this point of view. Of course, the physics of the thermal system uh, is different. And maybe I should just mention here uh, why we are even interested in this in the context of uh, QCD. So one important motivation are the um, heavy ion collisions um, that uh, major experiments that have been ongoing for uh, several decades and try to um, study the properties of uh, uh, strongly interacting matter um, in extreme conditions, so at high temperatures, uh, at high uh, density. And there also the uh, observables that have to do with uh, photons uh, play an important role. Uh, they are important um, observables in these experiments. Another context where these thermal spectral functions play a role is if you uh, look at the early universe and wonder what uh, particles may have been produced by the quark gluon plasma in the uh, first microseconds of the universe. Um, and there are scenarios for dark matter where uh, sterile neutrinos, for example, could, could have been produced um, by the quark gluon plasma. Um, and there the essential uh, quantities one has to know to determine these production rates uh, are again the spectral functions of the vector and axial vector currents. Um, so now let's just look at this, uh, this slide more precisely. So there are of course uh, different regimes um, uh, and I would like to focus here on the choice of two independent variables. One is uh, the energy variable, uh, which represents the energy of the photon in the rest frame of the thermal system. And then there's the, its virtuality, Q squared. So uh, if you're looking at vanishing virtuality, Q squared equals zero, then uh, you're looking at um, the ability of the medium to emit photons uh, as a function of the energy of that photon. Um, if you're looking at the time-like virtuality case, that determines uh, how many, you know, pairs, electron-positron pairs or muon pairs uh, the medium produces per, per unit time, per unit volume. Uh, and this has been known for a long time. What has been uh, looked at um, a lot less because it's maybe not as directly uh, relevant for uh, heavy ion phenomenology is the case of space-like virtuality. Um, in that case, you can convince yourself that these uh, spectral functions measure the ability of the medium to convert the energy of external electromagnetic fields into heat, so to dissipate that uh, external energy. Uh, you, you can go through that exercise. Uh, it is is a case that you can work out with some uh, expressions that you will find in Landau and Lifshitz. Um, but so the rate at which you dissipate this electromagnetic energy is really directly proportional to uh, these uh, spectral functions. All right, so 
staying then for the to the with this case of space like virtuality um you can ask yourself you know what can possibly create that external electromagnetic field um whose energy is getting dissipated well one way is to scatter a lepton on the quark lone plasma so you can imagine here a bucket of uh, this um hot hadronic oh, hot strongly interacting matter and um, a lepton scattering of that medium by emitting a single photon um so one can write, write down the, the cross section for that per, per unit volume uh, plasma uh, in, in a very similar way as one writes the cross section for uh, a lepton to scatter of a proton. Um, and that is determined by that um, expression here where one has the contraction of a so-called leptonic tensor with a hadronic tensor and all the interesting properties of, of the medium are of course, contained in this uh, hadronic tensor. So most of this talk is the is the content of this recent paper here, uh, written in collaboration with Marco, Tim, uh, and uh, Ariana Toniato. So then let's look at this hadronic tensor in, in more detail. Um, uh, this is really very uh, similar to uh, what Max showed in the previous talk, uh, that you simply have this uh, product of operators acting um, on uh, that uh, same external state, left and right. And uh, if you remember, for the spectral function, we had a commutator here. And uh, indeed, these objects with commutator or without your commutator are related by uh, the kubo martin Schwinger property. Um, which means um, there is a pointwise correspondence between these two functions um, just given by this uh, this relation here so for these vector currents they are then two uh, independent structures one can write with the help of that external momentum of the photon q and the four velocity of the medium u Okay, which is a uh, it has a property that u squared is one um, as a four vector, and then with these two vectors you can write two independent structures, and so you have completely analog analogously to the case of the proton two independent structure function of the medium, um, and those are the ones that therefore determine that um, cross section of the lepton scattering of the medium. Okay, so one limit that is known to be interesting in the context of an, ele an electron scattering of a proton is the so-called deep elastic scattering limit or Burkean limit, uh, which amounts to sending that virtuality of the photon on the space-like side to infinity, but keeping a certain combination of variables fixed. And that is um, this variable X, which in the present context of thermal, uh, the thermal physics would be this combination. So Q squared over two times temperature times the energy of that photon in the rest frame of the fluid. Um, <clears throat> so, Another way of saying the same thing uh, to, to, to describe this limit is to say that, you know, when you calculate that virtuality of the photon by doing the spatial component squared minus the temporal component squared, there has to be a large cancellation between these two terms um, because Q naught by itself has to be as large as the, as the squared of the momentum here. So there has to be a large cancellation between these two, almost as if you were uh, in, in, in sort of light cone kinematics. But nonetheless, what is left over of this cancellation is still large compared to the, the temperature energy scale. Uh, so it's a very, very special uh, kind of limit, of course. And um, 
Okay. Um, so one difference with um, the IS on the proton is that this X variable is not bounded. It's not a compact variable. And this simply has to do um, with the fact that um, in the proton, you cannot produce um, something lighter than the proton in the electron proton collision. That's what leads to X being bounded by one. Uh, and in there is no such thing in the case of uh, an electron scattering of quark gluon plasma. So X is unbounded. And this has some consequences, makes some difference, uh, as we will see. So um, in the electron proton scattering case, there is a, um, yeah, a partonic interpretation of the structure functions when you are in this deep elastic scattering regime. And um, the analog of that for the thermal medium is uh, you have to think of uh, you know, the distribution of these little scatterers, these partons uh, in the fluid carrying a certain momentum. And the way you can parameterize that momentum is that it's collinear with the velocity of the fluid. Then you need some typical energy scale of the fluid. So let's take the temperature. And then you know, there's some, some proportionality, proportionality factor there. And so that, that C is precisely that uh, sort of variable measuring the longitudinal momentum of these partons. So then uh, you, you can see that the uh, interpretation of the uh, F1 structure function in that DIS limit is that it is given by that um, probability distribution of partons carrying a certain longitudinal momentum. Here, uh, because you're dealing with the fluid, uh, you have to think of it as being a density of partons in, uh, in the transverse plane. So transverse to the velocity of the fluid. Uh, that's a difference with um, standard deep elastic scattering. Um, so one can illustrate this in the case of non-interacting quarks. And um, there one can take the expression of the uh, uh, spectral functions for non-interacting quarks and, um, and, and convert that into a statement of what happens to the structure function F1 in the DIS limit at fixed X when Q squared goes to infinity. And this is uh, then what one finds. So it's simply this rather simple function in x times log of one plus the exponential. And you can see in this plot what happens. So uh, in that limit q squared, um, where q squared has gone to infinity, you get this uh, black curve down here, which you know, looks like a probability distribution. It's positive and uh, is normalizable. So uh, this is consistent with a probabilistic uh, interpretation of this uh, um, structure function as a part on distribution function. However, if you are not um, at Q squared infinity, then you can also see that uh, this, uh, um, this uh, structure function does not go to zero at large X. And so it is not, um, uh, it is not normalizable. Okay, so we, we will get back to this point. Uh, and this is a difference again, uh, to do with the fact that X is not a compact variable here. You can also see uh, easily that the Kalman gross relation holds. So F2 and X, F1 are related by this uh, relation at large uh, Q squared, so in the DIS limit. And that's just reflecting the fact that the scatterers in the medium are spin one half uh, fermions, as in the case of the proton. So one standard tool to, to study the, the structure functions are the, um, is the operator product expansion. Um, and out of there, one can derive these uh, moment sum rules. So if one takes these moments of the structure functions, 
um, that must be equal in the limit of large Q squared uh, to these expectation values of uh, local operators. And they are exactly the same operators as in standard deep elastic scattering. And of course, as in the case of the proton, also uh, this right-hand side is in principle computable uh, using lattice QCD. Um, it's the same operators. One uh, subtlety is here that the point that before you take these moments, you have to you know, uh, truncate, so to say, the structure function to only the leading twist uh, bit. Um, so because the, the subleading twist contributions can make this uh, integral not converge uh, at large x. Large x means a low energy of the photon. That's uh, a subtlety uh, that comes, uh, which is not present in the case of a proton. So then one can wonder how to, how to probe these um, structure functions of the medium uh, in that space-like uh, regime. And uh, so this would be one way to do it. Um, yeah. Um, so here we're looking at the Euclidean correlator of two uh, spatial components of the current, and um, we are fully transforming here um, with a Matsubara frequency omega n. But then in space, we have this. Um, real exponential, which in some sense means there's an imaginary spatial momentum that's being injected here into this, to this correlator. And then one can show that um, this um, correlator um, it obeys a dispersive representation with one subtraction necessary, which allows you to probe um, that transverse spectral function um, in a way that you could study its Q squared dependence because nothing else here depends on Q squared if you keep these uh, variables fixed uh, when you vary Q squared. That, that spectral function here is related as we saw by the Hugo martin schwinger formula to uh, the structure function of interest. So this can be a way to study uh, how you approach the Bjorkian limit and to see scaling violations. Um, numerically, this is a quite tough um, undertaking, but it's in principle possible. Um, again, to make the connection with zero temperature physics, um, this is um, similar to what was proposed 20 years ago in this Ji and Jung paper for studying the forward Compline ampl amplitude on the nucleon, except that uh, there, the imaginary momentum was injected uh, in the time direction, which is not possible in the thermal context. Uh, and that's why, hence the idea to inject the imaginary momentum in space instead. So, so much for the regime of uh, space like Q squared. Um, I want to return now to the, to the case of uh, uh, zero virtuality. So um, as we said, so the, the at zero virtuality, uh, the spectral function uh, describes the uh, rate of photon emission by the medium um, and the precise expression is given here. Uh, that sigma of omega uh, is uh, up to that sign the same uh, thing that was on the previous slide, which in turn was connected to the structure function. And um, it would be nice to probe directly uh, that uh, function sigma over omega. And so the way to do that is to uh, take again one of these correlators, which has a definite Matsubara momentum in time or Matsubara frequency, but has uh, a spatial momentum, which is I times that uh, Matsubara frequency, because in 
um, Minkowski kinematics, that means that the virtuality is zero. Um, so then that, um, that, that correlator up to one subtraction that you have to do obeys again this um, dispersion relation in terms of this function sigma of omega that you would like to know or constrain. And so in principle, this is, um, can be seen as an inverse problem for um, that function sigma of omega, which would directly tell you the photon in emission rate. Um, but of course, it is already uh, very interesting to simply know one of these moments. So without even trying to address the uh, inverse problem. So um, these, this difference here uh, directly tells you something interesting about that photon rate. And uh, for example, that difference for two different values of N and R uh, would be zero uh, in the non-interacting plasma of quarks. So it's really only interactions that allow photons to be emitted. In addition, you can also be interested in uh, more integrated quantities. So not this function pointwise in omega, but maybe the total you know, power carried away by photons, in which case you would just compute this integral here. And then you would be in a situation where you're not necessarily trying to determine that function itself, but just some, <clears throat> some integral over it with a known kernel, uh, which would be essentially this function times that omega. And um, this is slightly uh, slightly easier than determining the function everywhere in omega. So to, to go in this direction of realizing um, this program, we have uh, come up with a way to compute these uh, uh, correlators at uh, zero virtuality. So which have uh, a definite Matsumara momentum, but also uh, an imaginary momentum in space. And we figured out that you need to do um, a, a subtraction in order to make this object um, ultraviolet finite in the lattice regularization. And this has to do with the lack of Lorentz symmetry, um, uh, which makes this uh, subtraction necessary. That subtraction term is simply zero in the, um, in the continuum. Uh, but here it's helping us to make this uh, have a smooth continuum limit. So some numerics is underway to, to get these types of correlators. And this is then the integrand that you have to, over which you have to integrate to get that correlator H, uh, HE of omega. And um, it, you know, this integral in that spatial direction is converging relatively slowly because you have that real exponential in there that's enhancing the long distances. But nonetheless, um, at least for n equals one, one can control that uh, quite well. And uh, it quickly becomes more difficult when you increase um, the Matsubara mode. Okay, so in conclusion, um, it is interesting to think of dispersion relations for uh, the thermal spectral functions at fixed virtuality rather than fixed spatial momentum as has, has been done so far. And this opens up new, some of new perspectives or new handles on the thermal uh, spectral functions. Maybe the most important take home message is that certain moments of the spectrum of emitted photons can be computed in lattice QCD without solving an inverse problem. And that's made possible by writing these dispersion relations at fixed virtuality. And in the same way, if you're interested in the uh, DIS limit to try and understand what are the constituents uh, of the quark gluon plasma, um, for that, you, you would follow the same type of uh, uh, calculation with these uh, imaginary spatial momenta. And you have to reach then this uh, DIS regime, which is uh, possible, but numerically uh, challenging.
So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Harvey. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting and impressive talk. <clears throat> I will also do the clappy thing. Are there any questions right now? Any questions, comments? No, not so far. <clears throat> hmm. Oh, John, yeah, go for it. You're very quiet though. Perhaps you can go closer to your microphone or uh, still very quiet. It's a new laptop on the call. How about now? Oh, yeah. Um... No significant improvement. It's very quiet. I, I don't know, Harvey. Can you can you okay, hear what, what is? It's not okay. Uh oh. Uh, maybe I'll just type it in the chat. Yep. Then I'm really. Okay. Um... You'll just type it in the chat. So you do... oh, you're in full screen mode. I can read it once it uh, once it uh, pops up. Okay, perhaps while John John is typing, I think like so, this take home message that the the best solution to the to the inverse problem is to get rid of the inverse problem, I think was uh, was was quite nicely demonstrated here. But it also shows you that it is a that it is really a it depends on the physics it's observable that you're interested in. You have to custom build it every single time. That's right, correct? There's no generic like. When we do the inverse problem, it's somehow a generic equation that we've seen through across many fields. But what you've built here is really a, a sp observable, specific recipe uh, to do to to get to be done with it. And that would be your message, right? That you would have to sit down and really think about the problem in any dimension and viewpoint you can think of, and perhaps there's one that eliminates the inverse problem. Is that right? Yeah, so I think you in this case you can at least learn some things about that um, photon emission rate without solving the inverse problem. Whereas, you know, if you attack the problem with at fixed spatial momenta, then um, to get to get even one point uh, on this uh, function sigma of omega, you need to solve an entire inverse problem. And um, no. that's that's much harder. So um, of course, then if you if you do want that function sigma of omega, also with that method with fixed virtuality uh, dispersion relations, you will have to um, address the inverse problem. But um, yeah, I think. First, we have to show that we can get uh, these um, these observables with the imaginary momentum under control. And um, I, as I said, I mean, these are already interest, very interesting by themselves. Um, if we get really good at it, then at some point we could address the inverse problem, you know, but that's for the moment, it's too early to, to even think about that. And uh, John uh, typed his question and it's somehow related. I assumed I had to turn my uh, volume up, I think. Uh, is this any better? Yeah. Now it's too loud. Now it's very <laughs> Here, I'll go for the middle ground. Um, yeah, perfect. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, just the question was, if anything can be learned instead of at fixed spatial momentum from looking at um, sort of fixed time separation correlators where you uh, then look at the fall off in coordinate space. In, Um, sorry, so are you asking about the, the usual, I mean, the representation? I guess this would be more for the thermal rate, um, uh, where, uh, 
I mean, the, the usual spectral problem is defined in, uh, in, in time, but uh, you could also, uh, especially at finite temperature, I would think it would make sense to, to define it in space, uh, use the covariance of the... Oh, okay. So, um, so the, um, yeah, I mean, the, um, these correlators, so how quickly this will converge, the, how quickly this will converge this, this integral over the Z direction, um, this is determined by these uh, screening masses. Right, right. Um, that are different in every one of these Matsubara sectors. So, you know, you have a spectrum of screening masses in every one of these um, omega n um, Matsubara sectors. And ultimately, it's, it's those, the low lying ones, that determine how quick, quickly that converges. And so, indeed, there's important physics in these correlation links. Uh, the non-static ones. And uh, with Anthony, we already realized that seven years ago that these are very interesting. But now the connection is much more concrete. So with the photon rate, for example. So because that spectrum really determines how you converge. Um, but you see that you... Um, Let's say if you're just interested in this real photon rate, right. then you have to, you know, for one Matsubara sector, you're only interested in one integral over X3. So, um, because it's only that one integral that realizes the uh, virtuality zero condition. Uh, I see. I see. Right. If you're interested in fixed virtuality, I guess this doesn't. Doesn't work super well. If you're also interested in the space-like virtuality, then you can also inject a, a, a smaller um, imaginary spatial momentum, smaller than omega n. And then you're in the space-like regime and you can study these DIS type questions. Um, yeah. Thanks. <laughs>